Evening. It all looks like there's a few people here, so now we're doing one minute past start time. So um, I will uh, welcome. Um, thanks for joining me this evening. Um, and we're going to be talking about getting those standout action shots. Well, not necessarily action shots, sharp shots, because it's not always about fast moving subjects. Um, so um, just the way it's going to work then, I'm going to talk you through all the various things that I do, tips and techniques in terms of getting some of the kind of images that I um, managed to get that people seem to like. Um, but if as we go along, you've got any questions about um, what I'm talking about or the academy um, or anything else, I'll just put the link in here, which you've probably seen anyway, to Beyond the Lens Academy while everybody gets online. Beyond the Lens Academy.com. Make sure I spelled it right. Been a long day. Beyond the Lens Academy.com. Okay, so that's the website. That's um that's where we are. So um the the purpose of this, this sort of meeting, this webinar really is, I've, as you've probably all seen, I've done quite a lot of Facebook Lives, just telling everybody about the Academy and a few sort of tips and tricks and a few people ask questions. But I thought I'd actually come on and do more one of the sort of more typical webinars that we would do inside the Academy. Um, and so that's kind of what we're gonna do today. So the kind of images um, that people are often asking me about, I'm just gonna find me pictures in a minute, um, that they'll like, they sort of say, oh, you know, how, how do you get images that sharp? I mean, it, it's not just dogs. I mean, obviously, if you don't know me, I'm Carl Thomas, by the way. <laughs> Carl Thomas Photography and Beyond the Lens Academy are both my businesses. So these are, that's a nice sharp shot, but it's, it is fairly still. Um, here's the opposite. That's a nice sharp shot, but very not still. Um, those things move like, oh, well, really, really fast. So we'll be touching on this in a minute. Um, what else? Let's just, so here we go. Dogs in midair. I'm scrolling through this sort of stuff. Look, there's a whole so getting sharp shots is all is not necessarily always about the same kind of thing. You know, people often think you know fast action for me is this sort of stuff. And yes, as a on my dog photography business is all all about getting you know sharp images. Um, but sometimes a sharp image is is more about you know this sort of thing, getting the detail in an image. Um, and so a lot of people will naturally assume that when I talk about sharp images, it's about fast moving things. And of course. It's harder to get a sharp image of something that's moving at, at 300 miles an hour, like this little bee buzzing, um, or this gannet um, sort of hovering above the cliffs when we're up in the Scotland workshop. Um, this is a challenge. We've got white bird on white snow. So, and then of course this is what I, I, you know, what I'm well known for. So a nice sharp little picture of lovely Wilfred there, <clears throat> and then sort of these sort of things. So this is the kind of stuff that. Um, people often join the academy for they say oh i really want to get sharp images not just that obviously because we do quite a lot of things so i thought i'd just spend half an hour or so this evening and just talk you through um some of the things that i do in order to achieve those kind of images so uh, let me just get i'll put some on the screen here now that will surprise you um because a lot of people will think you know whether you're a beginner amateur or pro one of the most common perceptions is that well it's just about fast shutter speed to get you know to get really tack sharp shots and it and that's a big part of it um as is aperture, and we'll come on to that. But let me just, I'll put this up briefly. I'm not going to have to read this. Um, but there's a list of things, all of which have an impact on and, uh, and contribute to getting a sharp image. So I'm going to be talking through those sort of things this evening. So you might find some surprises, hopefully. But again, if you've got any questions or comments, just pop them in. So I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, so shall we make a start, seeing as it's, well, it's five minutes already and we haven't done anything. So let's get on with it. So the first thing. Um, and not necessarily in a particular order, but one of the most common things that can contribute to uh, an image not being tack sharp, even if you've got the aperture set right, and even if you've got the shutter speed and all the other things that I'll come on to set right, is the way you hold your camera. And I don't mean, you know, it's, and here, this is my 1DX, I can see a bit of a beast thing that I carry around, it's my favorite lens on here, 70 to 200. Um, but uh, um, it is such a common thing. So for example, you know, if you're holding your camera, with, without your elbows in or whatever, and you're just sort of holding it out here like this, there's going to be movement. So one of the most important things that, that I teach people in the academy, or talk about in the academy really, is before we start thinking about settings and all the other things, is just get used to using your camera in a smooth, fluid way. And if you can do that and hold it sort of steady and smooth, or like this, um, leaning against a wall, um, and so on. So because the thing to think about is, you know, yes, they've got image stabilization in them, and yes, you're going to have a fast shutter speed, and we'll come on to both of those as to why they have an impact, but they're not the only thing. But one thing to remember is, so this is a 70 to 200 lens. Now, I'm normally shooting dogs most of the time, or wildlife, but I'll use a longer lens for that. <clears throat> so if I'm shooting a, that buzzard that you saw early on, um, that might have been, I don't know, 30 meters away, 20 meters away. And so when you think you've got, and you're, if you're hand-holding, obviously we'll come on to tripod as well, but if you're hand-holding your camera, 
Um, and you think you're steady, but you've got, if I point it at you there, look, you just see very, very slight movement. That you would think if the dots in the middle of the screen here is going to be that sort of movement. Now, if you've got a fast enough shutter speed, you think, okay, well, that'll cover it. But just think about it for a minute. Imagine <coughs> this camera or your camera in your hand with a 20 meter piece of bamboo stick on it that's rigid. This very slight movement that is just probably just me breathing in and out is a little movement at that point there. But at 20 meters, it's this sort of movement. It's huge. And so you will see if you if you follow, you have a look on Facebook. Let me put the camera down there because it's quite heavy. <laughs> um, a lot of the sports photographers that are using really, really solid tripods, you know, like the baseball games and football matches and stuff like that. They'll be using a really solid tripod that probably costs eight or nine hundred pounds, tripod even, that might have cost eight or nine hundred pounds. One of those 400, 500, 600 mil lenses that probably costs about 15,000. And so they've got really bright lens, very fast shutter speed and um, uh, and it's on a tripod. So you think, well, that's, that's it, isn't it? But if you watch them, what they'll do is they'll steady the lens. They quite often hold their hand on the top of the front of the lens. <clears throat> and that's just to remove those minor little movements. But even with that kind of gear and that kind of setup can have quite an impact. So tip number one, get used to holding your camera in a steady, solid fashion if you're not using a tripod. Um, and also if you're panning, get smooth with it. You know, I mean, so one of the, I'm give the camera again, one of the, the most common things that I see with um, um panning photography, especially if it's birds in flight or motorsport or even children running at a Christmas fate or a sports day or whatever, is you'll be looking over there and think, oh, look, there's, 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 the, there's the bird, it's coming over, you get all comfortable, and you start panning, and by the time you get to the, the money shot, so to speak, where you want to be, your body's twisted. Uh, and it's a simple little thing, <clears throat> but so what you want to be doing is getting yourself in the zone where you want to be taking the photo and get you comfortable and then start off frankly very slightly twisted so that when you get to the point where you know the the money five feet you're comfortable and you're moving your camera in a comfortable way uh, <clears throat> it might sound in, it might it might sound like it's not the be all and end all but trust me we've been doing it long enough um and it's one of the reasons i one of the things that contributes to getting sharp images and, what, and a lot of the things i'm going to talk about this evening are individually on their own they're all minor things um <clears throat> some of them are important like you've got to have the right shutter speed and you've got to have a camera switched on and all those sort of things but if you take these probably 10 or 15 points on there and you get all those ticked when you're doing them, that's when you can start getting images that are sharp, but really sharp. Um, and that's the thing that, you know, people want. So the next thing is focus points. Now, lots of cameras have lots of different focus points. So mine has, I can't remember now, 64 or something like that, or 164. I'm a fan of using single point focus. Now, of course, <clears throat> um, at the, let me give you an example, show you a picture. It's always a bit easier to show some images. Right, like this one here. So this was up in Scotland, one of our workshops, um, and I used a 300 mil lens. I shot that at um, f2.8. The shutter speed was about two thousandths of a second, and my aperture was, well, I said f2.8. But I used single point focus, um, because on a DSLR, um, if you're using the focus tracking, which is what a lot of people will use, where you pick, the camera will pick all of the focus points and choose the one it wants, um, I use a single point and I point it at the head of the bird, which takes some skill because you, you've got to get it on. But if I hadn't done that, so in this case, I've got the bird sharp and it all looks lovely. But if I'd used the multiple focus points, and I'll come on to mirror this in a minute because I can hear you all thinking about that, um, then there's a reasonable chance it would have picked the wingtip at the furthest away or the wingtip nearest or maybe even some of the heather in the background. And that's an issue because then the, at a shallow depth of field, because this bird wasn't that far away because I saw it coming, I was able to track it, then it would be slightly soft. And so single point focus is, I mean, I use it all the time, don't use anything else. Um, the only time, let me just show you another image, where on a DSLR, um, the multi-point focus is potentially useful is this sort of shot. Um, and we'll come on to exposure in a minute. But on this kind of shot, if you've got all of the, all of the focus points switched on and it's tracking, there's not much else for it to get confused by. So there isn't a fence post, there isn't heather in the background. So it's basically sky or the bird. And what the camera sees is the black blob that it sees because it all sees in gray. And it's gonna grab the focus of that. So those sort of scenarios, it can actually it can actually work quite well. So a bird's up there on a DSLR. Now, um, let me just give it back to me correct pictures. So the, the mirrorless cameras now, in the last few years, they've come on leaps and bounds. And the technology is absolutely amazing. So, for example, the Canon EOS R5, if you just Facebook or YouTube, but some of the reviews uh, in terms of its tracking are insane in terms of how good they are. It's got IAF tracking, so it not only just locks onto the head of a person or a dog or a cat or an animal or a bird, it knows, 
um, but it will track the eye if it can. So that's a bit of a game changer. So that kind of, in a sense, changes the rules a bit. So if you've got a, an R5 or the, Z, the Nikon versions, or even the Sony ones, and Venice to Sony, they were there but well before the main brands were, um, that will be a very different scenario. And the reason, for example, on the Canon it works well is because it's got what's called AI learning in it. It doesn't mean it learns when it's taking photos. It kind of means in simple terms, it's a big thing I like to do in the academy is simplify things. It means that a lot of work has gone in before and in that chip and in the memory coding of that camera, it's been told what a bird looks like, what a human looks like, and what a, what a, a cat or a dog looks like, an animal. And so it recognizes them in its file of information and it goes, ah, that's a, that's a bloke, let's draw a person. So it'll, it'll keep, put a square over my head and keep locking onto my eye. And if I move around, it knows it's still my head. And so it'll start tracking the head and go back to the eye. Absolutely incredible. So that level of technology is, you know, um, a real game changer and is, you know, taking over the world a little bit. And at some point in time, I'm sure, you know, DSLRs will all go that way. Um, <clears throat> I'm not personally not quite really there yet because I do like my 1DX, but anyway. So um, now next thing, focus method. So let's assume you've, you're using a single point focus. Um, then the other thing that your camera will have is a number of ways of how the camera focuses. Um, and there's broadly two um, th that are of any use. One is continuous focus, which Nikon helpfully call AFC, continuous focus. Canon confusingly call it um, AI servo. Now I know what that means, but if you've just got a new Canon and you're trying to work out where the continuous focus is, you've got to look for something that says AI servo. That's a bit of a thing in the photography world. There are a lot of acronyms that are just odd. But anyway, continuous focus is what I use all of the time. The other kind of focus is single focus, where if you half press the shutter, the camera will grab the focus and stop and stay there until you take the picture. Now, if you're using a, uh, if you've got a subject that's moving or you're trying to track it, that is not going to work for you. You might get one shot. Um, <clears throat> the next thing people say to me is, oh yeah, but presumably when you do a dog or, or humans, they're still, so you could use single point or single focus as opposed to continuous. And the answer is no. Um, and the reason for it is, if you think about it, if you're doing people photography and you've got your camera and you are setting, you're, you're sort of composing the shot and you're using single single shot focus, it'll go zzz, and it'll sometimes bleep, it grabs focus and you're about to take the photo. Well, these, you are moving very slightly and so are the people, even when people are still, they're breathing in and out and moving around. If you translate that to wildlife, <coughs> wildlife, you know, sort of dogs, well, dog, you know, or, or um, a bird that sat on a post, you know, like a, the golden eagle that stood right in front of you, that sort of shot we've always wanted to do. There is movement going on. So those very subtle little movements might not seem like a lot, but from a distance, that can be enough to make the image look sharp, but not tack sharp. So I use continuous focus. And so that means that as the subject's coming towards me, the, the lens will keep up with it. But even a still subject, the lens will sort of track it and just keep it, keep it locked on. So that's my favorite uh, way of doing it. Now, the next thing is shutter speeds. Um, now, this is the most common one that people talk about. So if you want to freeze action or make sure a still subject is sharp, you need to have the correct shutter speed. Now, birds in flight, salmon, um, you know, um, migrating up the rivers, dogs, spaniels running at you at 30 miles an hour. You need to be at uh, over a thousandth of a second. Um, but you don't have to be four thousandth of a second or anything like that. Um, but typically, my typical shooting range for most of the shots I do when I'm not doing wildlife, um, you know, salmon and birds in flight when I'm doing the dog photography stuff, I like to shoot at about 1600th of a second. 1250 is about the lowest I go for an action shot, actually something physically running around. You can get away with it slower, but it takes quite a lot of practice. And if you're panning, of course, then you can get a little bit slower and then you have the dog's legs sort of blurred and the, the body still. So shutter speed is a really, really important thing. But what you don't want to be doing is just going, okay, well, I'll shoot at 4,000th of a second because one of the issues you're going to have there is that's going to be very fast, but it's a very minimum amount of light that's going to come into the camera in that four thousandths of a second, which means you're going to have to let as much light in by having your aperture at 2.8 or 1.8, which is fine, but you're likely to have to have your ISO high. And, that, and now I'm going to come on to that, but you do not want your ISO high for tax sharp shots. So the next thing, aperture. And these are called part of the exposure triangle, which I'm sure you know you may well have come across. Um, but effectively, aperture can have a huge impact on uh, sharpness. Now, it's a thing called depth of field. So if I show you some images here, uh, where are they? So now if you use it properly, um, it can be very, very powerful. So when I say shallow depth of field, for those of you who, who are watching this who are maybe a beginner, what that means is the technical description is the amount of image that's acceptably sharp. So what you'll see is, let me show you what I mean. It's probably easier than just talking about it. Where are we pictures? Right. So uh, 
here we go, he's <clears throat> a nice little doggy, <clears throat> excuse me, an annoying cough, so that his face and his eyes and his nose and his ears are sharp, uh, but behind him is nice and soft and in front of him is nice and soft, so what that means is there's a depth of field in that particular image of about, I don't know, a couple of three inches, so if you're using a shallow depth of field, which I use a lot, as you can see from these sort of images, look, background's all nice and soft, background's all soft and it's nice and soft, I mean this is a, a black background shot, um, but let's look at some, um, let's go back and look at that buzzard. Where has he gone? There we go. Actually, no, it's a kite fence. So a very shallow depth of field. Now, what that means is, of course, that you have to get the focus in the right place. So if I get the dog's nose, the eyes are going to be soft. And if I get the dog's ear, the eyes still might be soft because you've got a shallow depth of field. And sometimes um, the depth of field, if I shoot at 200 mil with my, my full frame camera and I'm 12 feet away, my depth of field is this much to about an inch um and so that's something in the academy we've got a whole series of webinars all about managing and controlling depth of field because if you if you've got that wrong and you haven't got enough of the image in focus or the bit you want in focus it won't look sharp um some lenses as well um sort of the mid-range lenses you know if they if they open up a say 2.8 as far as that sometimes they can be just a little bit sharper generally as a piece of equipment by what they call stopping down a bit so maybe to f3.5 or f4 or something like that um, they, they call it a sweet spot. <clears throat> now, some lenses are not. Well, I use the 70 to 200 Mark III Canon, and uh, it is, I mean, it's nuts. It's a brilliant lens. It should be costing me a fortune, but that is tack sharp all the way through the apertures, whereas some cap, some lenses really are noticeably better with stopping down a bit. So, um, ISO, next one. ISO, for those of you who don't know, it, is the sensitivity of the sensor to light. And so a lot of people, especially when they first start, and think, oh, that's all right then. To get more light in, I can have the shutter speed really high and have the aperture really low, and I just put the ISO right up. Now. For those of you who have cameras for a while, you know that that's not a good idea because you get this sort of stuff. So you've got on the left here, you've got like a really nice clean image, which is what's called, which, there's a term that they use in the photography world, um, <clears throat> shot at an ISO of 100. But on the right here, you can see ISO 3200. We've got grain, noise, snow. There's lots of different descriptions for it. And that that is that will seriously contribute. So an image that's focused, that is technically sharp, um, will not look sharp if you've got lots of noise. And the process for removing noise in editing edges off the um, the contrast a bit, so you, it will look even softer. So noise is, is a bit of an enemy. Noise is not just created by um, high ISO. Bad focus, um, poor equipment, um, average or dull light can be all a big a big part of that. So there's a whole lot of things that contribute to noise. But the main thing, let's put this thing out of the way, um, is getting used to your camera. So what I always say to people in the academy, is whatever camera you've got, you know, some cameras like mine, you know, I can almost shoot in the dark with it, it's hardly any noise, but then it costs an arm and a leg, and I, that's okay for me because I'm a professional and I've got clients and it, it's fine. But if you're if you're looking at a beginner and entry level camera, have a look at some of the reviews, and once you've got your camera, or if you've already got your camera, just go out and practice. Find an averagely sort of overcast day, not difficult in the UK to be honest, most days of late you can do that, and go out and take some shots, you know, in sort of average light of something that's not moving, like a fence post or something like that. And start at as low as you can get away with the light, you know, 100, 200. Take some of that shot, then take it, make it 300, make it 400, and get used to, have a look at those images then on your camera, on your computer. And just start to see where, I call it sort of the red line, like a rev counter in a car. Find out where where the the noise level is too much, where you can't recover it in, in editing and processing, um, and it's just too high. And then that gets you used to sort of saying, oh, I like to go no more than 800 ISO or no more than 1500 ISO or whatever it might be. Really important little little thing to do. Um, so it does help. Now, um, what else? How are we doing for time? Well, plenty of time. So the handheld rule. Now, this is another thing that um, some people kind of forget. So obviously, you know, tripod is something you can use, but we're talking handheld at the moment. So I use a full frame camera, which is one of these. Um, and what the rule for a full frame camera is simple, it's sim kind of simple maths really. So people say to me, well, what's the, what's the slowest shutter speed I should be thinking about on my camera before I need to use a tripod? Now we'll come on to image stabilization in a minute. So hold your thoughts on that because that does help you get lower. But assuming you're using a lens that doesn't have image stabilization and a lot of people will be using cameras like that. Um, the rule is fairly straightforward actually. Whatever the focal, on a full frame camera, Whatever the focal length is that you're using, so zoom, so say you've got a 100 mil lens on your camera, then you need to be shooting handheld at, at least a hundredth of a second or more, assuming the subject is static, and I don't mean a person, I mean I'm talking about like a, a monument or something granite that is properly still. 
then that that's the rule. So if you're shooting, if you've got a 50 mil lens on, then it's a 50th of a second. Um, if you've got a crop sensor camera, <clears throat> um, so which a lot of people will have, um, so if you've got a Nikon, it's called a D, uh, DX, um, and Canon, um, it tends to be the EFS lenses, so but most of the sort of um, 50D, 60D, 70D, 80, 90D, all those, 70 Mark II, have got a smaller sensor. Brilliant cameras, but what that does mean is that there's a, a crop factor on the lens. So a 100 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera is, if you were looking at this as the viewfinder through my camera, if you put it on a 100 millimeter, put it on a crop sensor camera, you get cropped in like this. One of the reasons wildlife photographers like them because they can get a better reach, in theory, on the picture without spending a fortune on a better lens. Now, all you do is times it by 1.6. <clears throat> oh, well, it depends. Some cameras are 1.5, sometimes are 1.6. So you just go one and a half. So 100 mil lens is the, uh, technically 150 mil lens. So it's 150th of a second. And it's a really important rule. Um, and it's it's very, um, it's very, very sort of powerful. If you, you spend time practicing, getting used to taking shots at low shutter speeds. And again, it comes back to the first thing I talked about. That rule is true, providing you're stood comfortably. And you know, I, and for me, what that often means is I'm lying down because you know I'm doing dog photography. Well, actually, sometimes with wildlife photography, I'm lying down and I'm getting comfortable, and I'm, I might even use a bean bag or just rest on my camera so it's nice and still. Um, so that's the handheld rule they call that, um, and it's quite an important thing to think about. I'll come on to image stabilization in a minute because lots of myths around that, um, which I'll hopefully dispel for you. So let's see, any comments? Anything? Any questions? No, we're very quiet this evening. Please, if honestly, if you want to ask any questions, please do. So uh, I'm happy to do that. So. Um, Right, lens speed is another thing. Now, what I mean by that, it's a confusing term, I know. But what that means is a fast lens is, is called that typically, not because it focuses fast, because it allows more light in. So f2.8, which is the lenses I use, have got a much bigger piece of glass on them and better optics, and they will let in a lot more light at their widest aperture. Um, whereas an f3.5 lens or an f4 lens will be uh, there's nothing wrong with them, very, very good. Um, but they, they let in less light. So a fast, the more light you can get in onto your sensor, um, the better, certainly because it will help reduce noise and everything else. So, uh, you know, fast lenses are gonna help you in terms of getting action shots that are sharp or just generally sharp images because you've got, got more light to play with. And it allows you, the main thing is it allows you to keep the ISO low. Um, so that, that's quite important. Now, um, I talked about f-stop as well, I mentioned that again. So sometimes even with 2.8, you know, if you're quite close to subject, um, you might want to just drop it down to 3.5 and, at, you know, F4, F5, something like that. And those that doesn't sound like a lot. But let me just show you um, in terms of light, because some people say to me, yeah, but the F2.8 is like two grand and the F4 is is 900 quid. Well, and if you look at this, it doesn't look a lot different, does it? Between 2.8 and F4. If you look at the top there, effectively, for those of you who are beginners and not sure, aperture is the hole inside the lens that can be made bigger or smaller via these little blades, and that's how you increase or decrease, decrease the amount of light. And interestingly for photography, as the number gets bigger, the light gets less, it's just classic. But what you can see is there, 2.8 to f4, doesn't look a lot, but it's 100% more light, or 100% or less light, depending where. So you've got a 2.8 lens, and you go to f4, you're, you're reducing your light by 100%. Well, 50%, not 100%, because otherwise there'd be no light, but it halves it. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind. Um, so now we're getting into some stuff here now that may surprise people. So things like sensor dust, that can be an absolute nightmare. It, you get these spots and, and rubbish that get into the sensor over time because you're using the camera regularly. And when you're with an SLR, <clears throat> as you take the images, let me just take, take this lens off here and just show you. I'm sure you've all seen it, but for the purposes of those who are new to it, so inside there is, you probably won't be able to see it because there's not enough light, but inside there is the mirror. And when I press the button, this thing shoots at 14 frames a second, so it sounds like a machine gun. That mirror is flicking up and down out of the way and the shutter's opening and closing. And during that sort of process, over time, any dust that's in this part of the camera as a result of taking the lens off, I'll come on to that in a second, can get inside there and get on your sensor. And that can contribute to less sharp images. Um, so a couple of tips. First tip, get yourself one of these little blower thing. So don't get in there with earbuds or anything like that. So every now and again, just open your camera up, hold it this way up, just give it a bit of a puff, just to get the dust out. Because that little mirror, when it's flipping up and down, even if some of the entry level cameras are three or four frames a second, it's like a little fan. So any dust that's in there is gonna be moved around and chucked all over the place. So you wanna avoid that. And actually cameras every now and again, I mean, on this one I've had it done 
pretty much every year. So I get, I don't bother trying to do it myself. I send it off to Canon Professional Services and they clean the sensor. So it's nice and clean. Um, now, to, in order to help avoid dust inside your camera, one of the things that you can make sure you do is when you're out in the field and you change your lens, don't, you know, a lot of people put it on their back. I've seen them do it all the time. Put it on like that, open it up, and then put the other lens on. But then anything that's floating around the air can just settle on your camera and inside there. So I always, if I change my camera, especially in inclement conditions, I take I take the lens off like that, whoops, the lens off like that, and then put the new one on. And that reduces the amount of dust. Now, some people say, yeah, yeah, but you get a bit of dust in the end of there. Or, sorry, in the end of there. Well, that's not the end of the world because you get your little pop and you get it off. And worst case, you can get a lens cloth in there if you have to because it's, it's a sealed optic. So there are a couple of things to think about in terms of dust. Now, one other thing um, that is... A, a, quite a good reason that or not a good reason quite a common scenario where people say oh i had a camera it had really really sporadic focus issues and uh, uh you know and it's usually a dslr and uh, in the end i sold it or I got rid of it or was something wrong with it or even worse i lost confidence and i just realized that photography wasn't for me or i couldn't get sharp shots let me tell you a very common scenario that is to do with so apart from behind this mirror not that you can, it doesn't really matter that you can see it, it's too dark isn't it, anyway but inside there's a mirror as you see it goes up and down um, and obviously you've got the shutter that opens and closes and behind there's a sensor. So that's one thing. But the way this camera focuses, um, if it's not being used in live view, which is where the shutter's open and it's using the sensor, is it's got little optical sensors in it that look at the image, they look for contrast. Uh, and that's the other thing in terms of getting a sharp image. One of the things you need to make sure is if you point your camera in continuous focus at a, a bland wall, like a magnolia wall, you'll hear the lens going zzz, 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 you can't get contrast. So, um, you need contrast, ideally, for it to get focused. So a black dog and an overcast light, even my bit of kit will struggle a bit. So you just have to think about that, and that sort of happens. But one of the things I'm going to talk about now is in here, the way this thing focuses is amazing. Obviously, it's all done by the computer, and it uses little sensors. But guess where those sensors are? They are in the bottom here. So I'm not going to put my finger in here. There's a little row, you can't really see them, a little row of tiny little, a bit like cat's eyes in the row, tiny little optical sensors. I think there's four might be even more, just around the bottom. And they are the things that see what the image is looking like and trying to get the contrast right to actually get the image sharp. So now just thinking about the, um, let me just see what question here. Is this a hello? Let's see. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. I like questions. Look at this. So, Joss, I found it. Do you know what? That is so true. I like a, a bit of shooting myself. 7200, but enjoy polo photography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried once a 500mm lens at a game, really struggled to get the right settings for sharp images. I usually shoot at 4.5, yeah. So, well, I'm just going to read that again because that's a question. I usually turn my but I enjoy. Can only get decent images when the action comes close to me. And once I tried a 500mm lens to get the right settings for sharp images, usually shoot at 4.5, try and keep the images below. Yeah, so what you'll find with distance, is the movement is more. So your shutter speed, uh, 1,600, I mean, that sh should be okay, but what you're, what you're getting, particularly with, with Polo, um, is quite often there's, um, depending on where your focus points are, so if you're, if you're using single point focus, you can put it on the area, on the rider or the, dog, or the horse's dog, on the horse's head, so you've got contrast, you've got, they'll have their, their kit on and they've got their, um, their bibs on and everything else, so there's colour and contrast, you'll grab focus there. If, if you've got multi-focus points, what's going to happen is it'll be trying to grab the legs or it'll grab the side of the horse that's nearest and a horse. So that's one thing. And if even if you've got enough depth of field, you know, say you've got a depth of field wide enough for the horse. If you think about a horse, quite often they are, not always, but quite often they're black or tan or, or dapple or whatever. It is difficult for the camera to focus. So it's just a practice thing. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. That would make a lot of sense. The 500mm lens is a great lens. But to be honest, if you're trying to shoot um, polo, in fact, I've done some polo shot actually, did quite a few years ago, it's quite good fun, um, up at Guards. You, the, if you need a 500 mil lens to be getting the image in there and you're, you're trying to pan it, it is, that is really quite difficult. Because as I said at the right of the answer here, 500 mil lens with the right shutter speed, you've got a subject that's moving and you're, if you're trying to handhold it, or even if you've got on a tripod, the movement of the, the, your fungal focus point, even if it's a single one, by the time you're out at the, the horse, can be enough to be on the horse, off the horse. Not just sort of, is it on the head or is it on the eye? It can be off the head. So <clears throat> hope that helps. That's kind of my sort of answer on that one. But um, but anyway, Josh, drop me a message. 
Um, because I'm happy, happy to chat to people. As, as if you look at the Beyond the Lens Academy Facebook page, you see all the reviews about what we do in the academy. You know, you don't have to be in the academy if you want to ask me questions. But I'd love to hear from you because it sounds like quite interesting photography. That so back to the, the um, focus, and this might have been your issue. These little pieces of these little um sensors sit in the bottom here, just in there. So if you think about that, um, if you get some dust in here. Which is, you know, all cameras get dust in there. It's not something you can completely avoid just because it's in the atmosphere. But once you get a bit too much dust in there, it's and notwithstanding the fact that some of it can get onto the sensor, if you get a couple of little bits of dust on one of those little focus points or focus sensors and they sit in the bottom, um, then your camera can't see properly. It will be trying to focus on something. And you know what it's like when you, if you wear glasses and you get a spot on it and it's like, oh, oh blimey, that's a bit odd. That's what's going on in the camera's brain. It's like, oh, so the focus will be miles off. Now, the reason most people don't work that out is because it will do it on a couple of shots and then it's fine. You think, well, what's that? It must be me. It has to be me in terms of, um, is that another comment? Let's just see. Yeah, no, drop me a message, Josh. Love to hear from you. Um, so it, it, can, it can knacker your confidence. You might think, oh, there's something wrong with this piece of kit. Because what happens is, imagine you've got this little row of four, four little optics sitting there and they've got little bits of dust on them, a couple of bits, one's in, annoying and getting in the way. You can't see it. You take a shot, well, on this camera, you know, it's like a machine gun when it goes. Um, you, the thing, the fact the mirror is flicking up and down, so it's like a little fan. So what happens? The dust gets moved around. It gets. It's a bit like a snow snow globe. You remember those things at Christmas? <laughs> so the dust gets all moved around, and it might sit somewhere else. And it might be weeks or months before it ends up back on that sensor again. So the way to get rid of it is just just keep doing this. Just not all the time. Don't be doing it all the time. But just every now and again. I probably do it. Once or twice, twice a week, I'll just, when I get home, I'll just a quick puff, just to keep dust out of there. And, you know, if, if you're starting to get a regular thing, then get your camera serviced, because that, that can be a bit of an issue. That's a good one. Best to clean your lenses. Now, that's a good, oh, that's a good question, actually. So, I use, there's two things that I would recommend, and this is a bit of a Marmite thing. I use a filter, first of all. And this, this lens has got a filter on the end of it, which is just a UV filter. So it doesn't really affect the image quality at all. Well, it definitely doesn't, trust me, because this lens is amazing and it, it's not noticeably different. But what I would say is don't go and spy this. I think this is about two grand or something like that. If you've got a really nice lens or even a 500 pound lens or a 200 pound lens, don't go and buy that and, and then go, oh, I'm going to put a filter on because it offers some kind of protection, which is important. But um, the main thing is it's easy to clean. Um, but if you then go and get, you say, like on this case, a good example, 2,000 pound lens. If I just went and bought a 999 filter to put on the end there, I'm, I'm losing all of the quality of the optics that are in this piece of glass and all the bits of glass in here. So the ones I, I recommend are B and W, B plus W. So this one is a, I forget what they call it now, it's an X Pro Digital. So it's got nano coatings on it. You know when you see those cars when they're brand new and it's all, they're all polished to within an inch of their life and you put water on it and it all just comes off like water off a duck back, duck's back. That's what happens with this, this filter. About 80 quid, might have been about 100 pounds. So it's a bit of money. But it does two things for me. It protects the lens. And when it does get dirty, just a decent lens cloth. That's what you've got to do. Keep them clean. Wash them now and again, but not, not with sort of soaps or conditioners and stuff like that. Just wash them. And it's literally just do that with it. And you can see. And this lens, that thing there, is, and you probably want me to see, but it's absolutely mint. And it, this thing gets covered in mud. And I'm out with dogs and hairs. But because that filter's on the end, it makes it easier. So definitely use that. On this end, a bit of a blower. You can actually get, and I've got one, a little stick. So if you get a fingerprint on there or something that won't come off, let me see if I can find it a minute. Where's it leave? Here it is. It's called a lens pen. This little bit of kit. So on one end, um, you've got like little carbon fiber bristles. So if you've got a little, uh, like on your mirror, doesn't a, a mirror doesn't affect the image quality, but it's annoying if you're looking for the view on as a spot. So you can flick with this and that will just flick bits of dust off. But on the other end, there's like a, a little, you probably can't see it, but like a little thing, and that's got sort of carbon fiber sort of pots in it. So that will get something that's sort of stuck the lens off. And um, I have fairness, I don't have to use it very often, but it's just another thing to do. So hope that answers the question, Hayley. Um, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Disobedient dogs. Yeah, get them trained. Now, seriously, what, what you do there, and I know we're digressing, but that's the whole point of the, these webinars. I like to sort of be able to help people. So disobedient dogs, I, I, and I work with all sorts of dogs, from dogs that are impeccably trained to dogs that have had no training. And the most important thing you have to do if you're a dog photographer is you have to have patience. 
Um, <clears throat> so what happens is a session with dogs that will not do, they won't sit and stay on and um, necessarily fetch a ball or any of those sort of things. You just have to be patient and you're going to have to start doing shots when the dog is doing what the dog's doing. Just let them do it. So patience, I'd say, is the most important thing um, and not overstress a dog. So where, where was it? Oh, yeah. So in terms of dust, that's that's important. You know, you need to make sure that that's not, not important. Now, <clears throat> another thing is another little tip. Now, when you when you look at your images and you see a sensor spot on there, there's a bit of dust on your sensor. You can see it on the on the image and you, you, you can edit it in Lightroom although, or Photoshop. Or, but the other thing I recommend you do is make sure you get your screen on your computer clean because I, I can think I've countless, I've lost count of the amount of times I've edited a little spot out that's in the sky or something or other, and it actually isn't. It's a dot on my, my screen on my computer where I've cropped or something. So that's always a bit of an amusing thing. But another thing to do is if you look at your um, mirror, and you can physically look at it and see if there's some dust on that, typically, but use the brush. But up, up underneath there, do you see that little reflection? It's like a matte colored piece of glass. That's called the focus screen. So when the lens, when the light comes into the camera, it bounces off that mirror up onto that focus screen. It's reversed. And inside here is a prism piece of glass that reflects it around like a periscope. And then you see it here. And if you're seeing dot or lines or dirt, the first thing is don't panic because it's de dealable. But what I often say to people, and you have to be very careful with this, is I would typically just put my lens back on, if I can remember which way around it goes on this one. Right, bear with me. Oh, come on. There we go, so it's on. Um, so what I would typically do is I'd get a button here, just release it, just turn the lens a couple of mils so it's free, look through the viewfinder, and if, if, as a result of turning that lens, just a couple of mils either way, if those spots move, you know that your spots or your dirt or your whatever is in the lens because if the lens is moving. If they stay still, it's either on the mirror, so what you then do is put it in live view and put the mirror out of the way and you can have a look, or it's on your sensor. So it's just a little technique to try and narrow down because sometimes it's a little bit hard to find. And if you're anything like me, if you want tack sharp images and you want them to be really stand out, you've got to get a bit obsessive, um, which is kind of what I'm like. Let's just see. Any more questions? No, nope. brilliant. So, uh, how are we doing for time? All good. What else have we got on here? So, um, yeah, I mean, we talked about a dirty lens. That is, um, you know, lens cloth. You can get, I've got, um, I don't know where they are, they're on my desk, the little Carl Zeiss wipes they use for your glasses. Um, they're quite effective if you've got rubbish on there. But just be careful. So if you've got a, a lens that, for example, if you've been down to the sea and you're photographing dogs on the sea or birds or whatever it might be, and you get sea spray, or and that's just sort of floating around. You get that on your your um, filter on the end, and it and it dries off. It's like sandpaper. So the best thing then is to let it dry off. Use one of these, or just be very careful because otherwise, you're like what you're doing is you're rubbing in grit. And now that's another reason for having a filter. So if you get your filter with a scratch line on it, or it's nasty, or it's, it's a bit knackered, you can just get a new one. If you ruin the front of the optic on your proper lens, then those can be replaced. But trust me, they're a lot more than a filter. Um, so keep your lens clean and both ends, you know, inside and, and the front end, because that that simple thing like that can be all the thing, the only thing that you need to worry about. Let's have a little look. Got another question. Thank you for your top tips. Are clean. No, that's fine. Not a problem, Gary. It is, you know, with all the people I work with in the academy, um, and uh, when I, you know, one to one and workshops and stuff like that, people often say to me, "Oh, I'm, I'm having a problem." And I look at the lens and go, "Look at the state of it." And also when you've got a filter on the end of the lens, when you first put it on, I always buy, when I get my lens, brand new lens, I put the filter on as quick as I can because it's like putting those screen protectors on phones. We've all done it, haven't we? You've gone and spent 10 quid on and you can put it on and it's like a hair in there. It's like, ah. So just be careful. Get a blower. Get yourself in a clean environment. Blow around that front of the lens. Make sure there's no dust in there. Get that lens then lens filter screwed on. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, I found I did a webinar only only during the week about photographing in bad light, not bad light, in bad weather conditions, which we live with quite a lot. So, Kerry, great question. So let me tell you what that is. There's moisture, basically, inside your lens, either inside the lens or the end. Now, there's, there's two things that could be a problem there. One is you might have got moisture inside it, in which case it may need servicing to get rid of get it out. But typically, the most common thing that causes it. So, for example, when we're going, going into... Um, the wildlife workshop we've got in Scotland in, uh, when is it, end of January, beginning of February, two weeks in the Cairngorms, plug, plug. Um, well, not that's it, they're nearly sold out, so, um, but it's cold. So we're up in the snow. This is a magnesium alloy body, so it's basically metal, and this lens is metal. Now, I, I have this on it to sort of protect it and just keep, it, keep me warm. But when you go out and you're, you're out for a while, 
and your camera temperature drops, they're fine. These things, these are things that shoot at minus 10 or whatever, it's not a problem. So by the time these things will stop shooting, you've probably frozen to death. So it's not an issue from that point of view. The issue happens is when you take a very cold camera from outside in a cold environment into your house and it's nice and warm. And then any moisture that's in the air, that will be, and there's always going to be a certain, a very small amount of moisture, even in lenses and in the body, it will condensate and it will sit on the inside of the lens. And a really bad scenario, I mean, I've seen cameras ruined, so where, where there's loads of moisture around and they just go into a hole and they you know, stick it on the side and it's quite warm, and then they go and power it up. And if you imagine the little circuit boards inside a camera, you know, there's thousands of little chips and stuff and circuits, if there's a layer of condensation on that, because it's just warming up, and you haven't let it warm up slowly and you switch it on, you can get short circuits and ruin your equipment. So my advice when it comes to that, which is again, what we're doing the webinar about the other day, is just do it slowly, kind of like thermal sequencing. So if you come in from the cold, even just out in the moment, I mean, it's about 10, 12 degrees outside, it's about 20 in here. So if you've been out for a while, you know, what I do is I put my camera in the car, I put the ca in, in the boot and I'll have the, my um, backpack that is in, just open so, just so it can breathe. And then I might bring it into the house, but I don't stick it in a particularly warm room. I might leave it in sort of the, we've got like a porch which is all secure. I might just leave it in there just to slowly bring it up to temperature. So that's that's the main reason they're causing it. If it's not because of that, then you might just have some moisture in there. And what I suggest you do then is leave your camera switched off and maybe your lens off of the camera. And if you've got a filter on the end, take the filter off and just leave it in a, uh, in a not hot, not the airing cupboard or anything like that, but just in a warm room just for a good few days and let it sort of dry out. Um, but yeah, that is... Um, and it's really annoying, um, it, you know, and we had some people on in Isla, not in Isla, in, in Kangles the other, other year when we were doing it, where they were kept getting that. So we were coming back into the car and um, I had the windows wide open and the temperature turned down, but everybody said, oh, let's get it warmed up. I'm like, no, oh. yeah, the minute we do that, well, your lenses are going to steam up. So I um, hope that answers your question, Kerry. Um, right, what else have we got? Uh, lens calibration. Now, this is something that is um, tends to be at like this sort of medium to sort of higher end lenses and cameras. But what that is, is effectively, sometimes a, ca a camera may be slightly out of, out of calibration. And what that looks like is if you focus on, um, uh, let's say a fence post, as far as the camera is concerned, and you look at it and think that's all right, the, the lens might be focusing, even though it's picked, say it's picked my, my glasses, but it might, focus, yeah, it might actually focus just slightly in front, that's called front focusing, or slightly behind, that's called back focusing. So it's, it's, it's targeting, it's not quite right. And that can be, you can adjust that on the back of a lot of cameras, like on mine, you can do it. It's a, slight, it's a bit of a process because what you have to do is you point the camera at an angle. You can get these little bits of kit that have got like a, like imagine a tape measure and you, you're pointing it at an angle at say the zero and then you can just, and with a very shallow depth of field and you can see that actually it's on the one. So then you just adjust it. But typically what I recommend is to get your camera and your lens calibrated once a year. If you're out there doing it regularly, whether it's wildlife or as a hobby and you've got decent equipment, get it calibrated. Nine times out of 10, in fact, I've never had an issue with a lens that is actually front or back focusing in five and a half years doing the dog stuff and 30 years of doing other things, but with, with cameras. Um, but it, it can happen. And the, if you've got a lens that's perfectly fine, the sort of things that cause it is, you know, it's been used a lot or you've, you, you've given it a bit of a knock and the, the sensor goes out. Or those little sensors that are in the bottom of the camera that I mentioned I've got a dust on, they've got misaligned. That's effectively how the calibration works. So um, let's have a look. That's all right. So, yeah, calibration is... Um, is, is an important thing to think about. And it can be the reason why lens is not focusing. And some lenses are worse than others. If you do all the, all the reviews out there, um, or it's Google lenses, you, and if you're thinking about buying a new lens, you'll find that, you know, some lenses, oh, this is a really good lens, it's tack sharp, and it's really, really good, it's a fantastic lens. Then another review might say about a different lens, and, you know, I'm not gonna mention names, because, you know, it would be silly, but, you know, some lenses are people say, oh yeah, it's a really good lens, but it's prone to front focusing, you know, and I've had to get a few, what they call copies, so replacements to get one that's balanced right. Because of course, the way they're producing the factory, there are tolerances because they produce these in the thousands. So if the tolerance, if it's if if exact on is zero, they can probably go plus or minus a very tiny amount. But if you get a camera body that's got the same kind of co concept in it, that's minus one, and your lens is plus one, then it might be soft. So um, worth thinking about. Um, what else? Tripod. So obviously, and it's an important one. I've got a decent tripod or a monopod. So once you get into low light. Um, or scenarios where you're going to be doing long exposures. So, for example, things like this. Um, where's it gone? Where are my pictures? Right, uh, bear with me. So, this sort of stuff, where we're doing a long exposure so that the rocks are nice and sharp, or this kind of thing, which we were doing in Isla, and um, we do the workshop over there in June. Um, then 
you, you're going to you're going to be talking about exposures that can be 20 seconds, 30 seconds, several minutes. So you need a solid tripod. Um, it doesn't have to be a really expensive Gitzo one that costs you know 1500 quid. But you know I use Benro, my I, I think they're really good ones, um, and they're a lot of tripod for the money, um, and are really sturdy. So that's important. One thing you can do if you've got a tripod that's at the bottom end of of um, the sturdiness scale, if there's such a thing, as in they're not rock solid, get. If it hasn't got a clip, if you imagine it's on its three legs, if it hasn't got a little clip under the middle of it, fashion one, get some, get a piece of um, a shoelace or something, just drag it around the top, and then get your bag, your camera bag, and hook it onto it. So if you've got a tripod and you put some weight on it underneath it, that will help. That will transform an average tripod into a thousand pounds worth of tripod just by having that weight on it. So a tripod's important, um, and the quality of the tripod makes a difference, and depending on your kind of exposures. And we're doing long exposures, as I've just said. I mean, another thing, another popular thing that we do in the academy is all about long exposures. I'm just trying to find an example of what that looks like. So, you know, the shot on the left, standard photo, shot on the right. So that I, I can't remember the settings on this one, but, you know, I don't think you think fairness is not even my image, but, you know, one might be a 20, you know, one, 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 two fifth of a second, and the one on the right might be 10 seconds. And you can't hand hold for 10 seconds. Um, you just can't. I mean, you can get pretty close if you're really good, but it's not, not something I recommend trying because it will frustrate you. Um, so a decent tripod is worth considering, or even a monopod, that can help. Um, now, let me just come on to the infamous subject of image stabilization, either in camera or in body. And we've got a couple more things to go, and I'll leave you in peace because I'm conscious it's your evening. Um, so image stabilization. Now, a lot of people, a lot of lenses have got it now. And it used to be a domain of very expensive lenses, but now even some of the entry level ones have got it. And it's a button on the camera, and it will say, on this one it says image stabilization, IS. On Canon's, so on Nikon's it's called VR. Um, and other brands got a DSCs on it. But basically, they, they've all got different names for it, but it, what it is is stabilization. And some of them have got it in the body as well. But let me just explain how it works, because, uh, and what it's for. The, the concept of it is that for the handheld shot of something that is relatively still, ideally still like a person or um, a fence post, not that you photograph fence posts, because it, what it does is it extend that, that handheld rule. So if shooting on this thing at 100 mil, I need to be at, I just realized my little protection means gone off this. Um, I need to be a hundredth of a second, below which I'll get camera shake. <clears throat> if I switch on the image stabilization, I could probably get go down to 1 25th of a second and still have a sharp image, not from the subject's movement, but from this, because it will compensate for it. Now, the way it works, let me explain how it works. So. What it's doing is compensating for this, this very, very small movement that's going on. And it's very simple. Let me find, let's, let's, let's imagine my, my thing is, a, is a, um, a lens. So in, inside, this, inside this camera, we've got this sort of movement going on. It, when you've got a camera with image stabilization on it in the lens, when you switch it on, you can hear like it whirring. So if you remember, I'm 56, so I can remember, the little things that used to get in Christmas crackers when you were small, those little spinny tops, and you spin them, and they'll just sit there and move around, and just gyroscopic effect. If any of you cyclists here have ever picked up a wheel when you're trying to mend a puncher and spin in it, you'll just suddenly see it and you try and hold it by the hub, you'll see how it sort of moves around. That's what these things do inside. There's lots of little motors. And so these pieces of glass, there's several of the optics are, when you switch on image, image stabilization, are effectively floating. So what happens is, when you're, oh, well, I'll exaggerate it, when you're sort of doing that, it's trying to compensate. Move over there, you can see it. So it's kind of, it's trying to keep that still and just compensate. Now, and it works very effective, and it's the same concept on a <coughs> on the um, sensor. So in body, in body stabilization basically means, so imagine that's the sensor. I do have some sensors up there, but someone's nicked them. Imagine that's a sensor in your camera. It has the ability to move, sensor shift it's called. So if if the focus is there and, it's, and the thing's moving, instead of what would normally happen is this is going on, it, it will try and follow it simple terms. So that's what it does, and it's not meant for action. Now, Canon and Nikon will tell you that, oh, well, they're, you know, image stabilization works really well for action, and, and sometimes it can, but I can tell you, after six years of using that lens, I tend to not use it for action, because if you think about what I've explained there in terms of how it actually works, and what it's trying to do, it's trying to sort of keep all the glass sort of, sort of still, and sort of perfectly still when you're trying to take a shot in low light. If you then transfer that, imagine that's still doing that, and then you start trying to chase a dog or, or your, your three-year-old running around or your spaniel or a bird in flight and you start doing this. So oh, yeah, it's up there. Those, those things would be moving those bits of glass around, trying to compensate for this. And what it will do is it will make your images softer. It's quite a common thing. Um, you can, and so I, I don't use it. When I've got action stuff going on, I don't use it. I have used it in low light and in low light, it's amazing. 
But for action, general all day photography, it's, it doesn't really help um, because of what I've just explained. Now, the, this, this one and some of them have the ability to have the um, different modes, basically. So typically they've got one mode, which is stabilizing sort of vertical and horizontal movement, trying to keep everything sort of still. But some of them you can switch on to mode two, which is where <clears throat> it doesn't deal with the horizontal movement. And that's meant for panning. So it's just it's trying to compensate for that. And it's, you know, try it. Try it with a, a few shots, with it on, and try it without it from an actual point of view. You will see a significant difference, trust me. Uh, it is getting better all the time. And on some of the more advanced lenses, they've got um, a third mode where the image stabilization only happens at the point that you, you actually release the shutter, um, which, is, which is quite powerful. Um, well, a couple of other things then, and I'll leave you in peace. Um, ETTR, I hate acronyms, but it's basically exposed to the right is what that means. And the reason it's called exposed to the right is when you overexpose slightly, the needle goes to the right. What that means is, is basically, if you're shooting in manual, then you just overexpose very slightly. Now, I do this with all my images. Now, in a scenario like this, let me just show you that. Um, where is this one here? This image here, a minute. Right. So, on something like that, I would probably overexpose him by one or two stops because, from a metering point of view, there's a lot of brightness in this scene. And if I hadn't overexposed, we'd have had a, a, an outline of a bird here that's basically a black blob. So, by overexposing a bit, in this case, a couple of stops, I was able to get the detail in the feathers uh, and everything else that I wanted. So, that kind of works. But if you, let's go back to my um, right section of images here. And there, oh, is that another question? Looks like I have a question. Um, it's just a UV filter. Drop me a message, Haley. I'll and just let me know what camera you got, and I'll send you a few links. Um, because there's tons out there, uh, different brands and stuff. But just get a decent one. But yeah, drop me a message, and I'll, I'll help you with that. Um, but yeah, UV. For, I mean, there's, there's there's polarizing ones and there's colored ones, but you just want a UV filter which basically doesn't do anything to the to the actual image quality if anything it improves contrast marginally um right so um what i was talking about yeah exposed to the right now there's a couple of reasons for doing that so i'm um, just trying to think of an image that will give you a good example of how here we go right, i know this is black and white um but this is a shot i did at the end of a photo session um with a client where um it's not set up we've done we we've taken thousands of shots and the, the dog was just just popped up and he cuddled him so we had a lovely little capture in the moment shot but the detail, and this is one of the things that people ask me a lot. They're saying, oh, I love your shots, Carl. The black dogs particularly, all the details in them. Um, here's another one. So, you know, uh, what I'm doing is overexposing slightly. So the reason for it, don't, and, and it's a balance, if you overexpose too much, everything's going to be too bright, and then you can't. You have what they call um, burnout, so you've got like white spots. You don't want that. <clears throat> and it's trial and error, and it really does depend on the image. But if you, generally speaking, as a rule, overexpose a little bit, so as I say, in manual, you're going to be overexposing slightly, so the needle moves to the right. If you're shooting in shutter priority or aperture priority, which a lot of people do, I do sometimes, then you can use exposure compensations, a little button with a plus and a minus on it, and just turn it up slightly. And, what, and there's two things about it. One is, if you imagine looking at the end of a bristle, I haven't got one here, but imagine that's a brush, and these are bristles, and, and it's in sort of average light, or even reasonable light. You can't see too much inside those bristles down to the bottom of the head. Now, our eyes, I don't know how many megapixels our eyes are, but there are a lot more than most of these posh cameras are. And so if your eyes can't see the detail that's in there, there's no way the camera will be able to. So overexposing slightly, allowing the sensor to have a little bit more light, gets into the into the subject a little bit. So you'll get, you know, this sort of level of detail that's in there. Look at that. It's all, it's all nice and sharp. Now, the other reason for it, oh, is this a question? Let's have a look. Let's see. That's, it's my pleasure, Ellie. Drop me a message. I mean it. Um, Lost my thought. Yeah, so th that that overexposing thing will help just get that extra bit of detail, so that when you come to edit the finish and your image and it's all nice and done, it's really tack sharp. It's another one of the sort of it's not really a secret. A lot of people do it, but a lot of people haven't come across it. The other reason for it is going back to our friend noise, was our enemy noise. Now, when you're editing in Lightroom, so you say you've got an image that's got a little bit of noise in it because you've maybe underexposed slightly, or you've shot it in the middle and it's just a little bit noisy. You can deal with that in Lightroom or Photoshop. I mean, I'm an Adobe accredited associate, so I spend my life helping people doing things like that. And obviously, I spend my life doing editing as well. But one of the things that in any form of editing, if you've got an image that is like this one here, imagine this is an image. So the background's a bit sort of a bit darker over there, look at the, the sort of uh, frames and stuff. And so if you wanted that to be lighter, you'd have to be increasing the exposure slider in Lightroom or increasing the shadows a little bit. And that would work. 
But guess what? It brings with it a bit of noise. Not a lot, but it will bring in noise. Well, if you have to go quite a long way, it'll bring in a lot of noise. So the other advantage of overexposing, apart from getting the detail there, if you overexpose, and I tend to do, you know, one like plus half, plus one, plus two sometimes, if it's like that bird that I showed you that was in, you know, in the sky. So I've got some to choose from. So I can get close enough so they sh the brightness is bright enough, but without being burnt out, so that I'm turning it down in Lightroom. And when you're turning it down in Lightroom, as in bringing the exposure down slightly, or maybe the highlights or the shadows, that doesn't bring noise. So generally, as a rule of thumb, irrespective of the kind of image, it's better to be slightly overexposed, because you, you, when you come to edit it, you'll get a nice tack sharp image. And then the last thing, I'm just conscious 57 minutes, not too bad, I'd like to say about an hour, um, is a thing called pixel peeping. And we all do it. Well, uh, it depends on who, who are all here, but what happens then is we get obsessive. So, and I do get obsessive about getting sharp images, and that's why you know my business has been really successful, and people love me uh, booking me for dog shots. But what you'll what you mustn't do as a photographer, what you must keep in mind is when you're editing an image. So you've got, I mean, I can't zoom in on this particular system, but if I'm looking at um, something like this, um, and I and I start zooming in closely, and you're you're looking at you're zoomed into sort of three hundred percent, and so you're looking at the eye and this sort of size on the screen, and you're going, oh, those whiskers or these eyelashes, they're not tack sharp. Mm. Yeah, I'm not happy with that. Just stop because it's we all do it. Just stop and think. Okay, that if that image, if imagine that you know I'm zoomed into an eye that's this sort of size on on a on a normal size computer. If you stop there and think, okay, well if that was actually printed at that size, it would be like a ten foot by twelve foot picture. And in reality, that's not going to be the case. Now, obviously, some people do that, and that's, you know, for posters and artwork, but our general photography, that's not the case. So just keep in mind, when you're starting to look at an image like this and you go, oh, I'm not sure, just keep in mind, very typically, uh, if it's going to be uploaded to Facebook, Facebook kind of ruins images a little bit anyway, um, so there's a bit of a compression algorithm. But if you're going to be looking at it on your computer or you're going to be putting it on the wall or having it printed or giving it to a friend, typically, um, if it's a desk, desk picture, they're going to watch it, at, look at it at arm's length. I'm, I'm putting my arm out now. There you go. So that's what, three feet, maybe not, maybe two and a half. I haven't got that. I'm not Mr. Tickle. Um, and just so look at your image. So just stop, make the image full screen on your on your computer, but not magnified. And just go back and just go, actually, that looks absolutely tack sharp. Because even the sharpest images in the world, I've got some that are absolutely ridiculously sharp, or, you know, using really, you know, really expensive lenses in the house. But if you if, if you keep zooming in, eventually you'll get down to one pixel. So it's a thing called pixel peeping. So just keep in mind, just stand back. And then just think about it. When you're looking at pictures you see on the wall, most people look at them, the, the, the picture you got above the fireplace of the children or the dog or, or you know, that burning flight that you're really proud of or whatever. That you're going to be looking at that at probably three or four or five feet away. And it will look tack sharp because you're not you're not zoomed right in. So um, that's kind of the main things. I mean, there's, there's and there is more, um, but I didn't want to spend up to take up too much of your time. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Let's have a look. No, it doesn't look like it. Uh, but I mean, I really appreciate you coming along. Um, I'm going to be doing more of these. I try and do this um, uh, Facebook Lives I've been doing sort of once a week. I mean, this week's been mad because um, we're the Academy, so I'm about to tell you, aren't I? So the Academy, it's not a big sale, but the Academy, Beyond the Lens Academy, to go to the website, which I've put on there, is closing for members tonight. We only open for three days every, every few months or so um, because once the member's in there, have a look at the reviews. Um, we spend our time, we're obsessive about supporting our members, whether you're a beginner, whether you're an amateur, whether you're an aspiring pro or anything in between of those things. There's the ability to join at monthly or annual membership. There's no tie-in. Um, there are some amazing offers at the moment. And in addition to that, if you go to the website, I'm just finding my notes because I, I, I got told off earlier by my financing because I got it wrong. But the discounts at the moment, because we were going to be increasing it, um, but because of everything that's going on, I've kept it the same, um, the level of discounts. In fact, they're slightly higher. So we've got discounts that vary between, let's have a look, 35% and 50% at the moment, to, up, up until midnight. And then once we're closed then, and we're trying to open before Christmas, but at the moment it's not looking likely. So it'll be sort of January, February time. So if that interests you, go and have a look. But in addition to that, and you'll see the codes on the website, We've, if you want to join on an annual basis, that's quite a significantly dis discount. That's about 50%. Uh, but there's a further 10% code which you just have to type in the word camera if you subscribe subscribe and it automatically takes another 10 percent off and if you want to join as a pro um, as pro aspiring pro monthly there's another 15 percent off that the reason i've done that one in particular is because there are a lot of people at the moment um we've got people in the academy who've joined literally and they've set up a new business and i i help them with that and that's you know important point to know about the academy there's no holds barred so if you're a pro aspiring pro a hobbyist and you think you might want to make some money on, on a part-time basis or you're a professional and you want to 
get your social media strategy sorted out or change direction, or you know you want to set up a business because of what's going on, then I share everything. All of the stuff I've learned in five years that's led me to the business I've got now, which is my dog photography page with the best part of 30,000 people following that and Instagram and bookings pretty much coming out of my ears, which is great. Um, so we, we cover all of that, and that's why I've added that in there, <clears throat> because it's got – and so some beginners and some amateurs have got joined at that level because there are unlimited one-to-ones. So what that means is I, I do one-to-ones with individuals, and that can be unlimited. So, um, you know, I won't spend any more time on that other than to say we're shut tonight. If you want to buy it as a gift or you want somebody to buy it for you as a gift, the annual one, which we've had a few people doing that, that can be done. So if you're buying it as a gift or you want to point to something, get them to message me, um, and um, – We'll work out which one is appropriate. So whether it's amateur, uh, beginner or aspiring pro, and, and that will be the annual one, obviously. Then that can be sorted out and paid for. And uh, we've got a special voucher that we can put together that's tailored that you can give the individual um, on the day or get from, from your other half because that's what you wanted. So that's become quite popular. But just drop me a message about that. Um, and that's it. The only other thing is if you do quite like what we've done tonight, um, and you want, and, but the academy is not quite right for you at the moment, I um, understand that completely. So get yourself on the mailing list on the website about halfway down, there's a big blue button that says add me to the mailing list. Two things, I don't spam people, I can't stand it. I get enough emails as it is myself from different companies. But what I do do is I'll email people out when I'm starting to do this format webinar, which I'm gonna start doing more often now. Because what I have been doing is been more of sort of a sort of a few hints and tips and a bit of advice, um, which is useful and people love it. But I think this seems to work better. It's more of a more of a training process. I think you get more value out of it. So I'll be doing more of those. And if you're on the mailing list, I can tell you when they are, basically. So let's have a little look what we've got here. A couple of questions. Um, right. How do you store a large set of photos? Right. <clears throat> um, I keep mine. That's a good question, actually. Where's let me show you? Bear in mind. I have these things here, which are my favourite bits of kit. So these are. There's lots of different sorts out there, but these are separate USB hard drives. This one's a two terabyte one. Might be four. I can't remember. I've got about three of them. So here's one thing you will find when you start getting in, really in, involved with your photography and really enjoying it, and that's what's happening in the academy. Have a look at the reviews. And so you'll take more photos and they'll take up more space. And before you know it, your computer's full up and sort of slowing down. So you need to have separate. So I use these um, and then they're not expensive. I mean, I think a four terabyte one's about 100 quid now. And so I have a lot of my images stored on that. For my client galleries on my website, they are stored obviously on the website when they've bought the images. And that's all backed up separately as well. So um, <clears throat> that's that's an important thing to do. One of the things we do in the academy, actually, there's a whole series about editing and workflow and storage strategy and how we do all that because that's really important. You know, once you start deciding whether you're a you know amateur or a pro or even a beginner, and you're going to start going, oh, I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that. You need to have an assistant because trust me, five thousand photos later and they're all in one folder, it'll drive you nuts. You can't. You've got to have a, an organised system. So we deal with that in the academy. Um, right. Any more questions, Jude? Well, hello, Jude. How are you? Thank you so much for all the pointers, Carl. That's not a proper tool. It's my pleasure. So, look, there we go. An hour and four minutes. That's probably long enough. I, I'll, as you could probably tell, I could be here all night. I'd love talking about photography, which is why we've got the Academy. So, if you're interested in joining the Academy, you know, on a serious note, I'd love to have you on board at whatever level um, and um, help you with your photography, whether you're a beginner and you just want to work out how to switch the thing on and get off auto, or whether you're a pro and you want to make some more, more money from your photography and anything in between. Um, <clears throat> so, we'd love to see you inside. We shut at midnight, and we do shut at midnight. Um, because I don't think it's fair to say what I've been saying all week and then open the doors on Monday and Tuesday. The only exception to that is people who have done one-to-one -one training with me um, and also the workshop. So we've got two workshops at the moment, the two-day ones that are normally here, obviously off at the moment because of um, lockdown. We might get one in December, but the one in Ireland in June, the two-week one, and there's a few spaces left on the second week because we've got an extra week, and the same in Scotland, actually. We've got the first week sold out in two or three days. I think it's because people just want to get away. People, Some people are bringing their partners as well. So if it's something you ever look at it and you quite like the idea of it, but people are bringing their partners because they just want to get away. But we've got an extra week in Scotland, which was a challenge because it was um, Burns time up there, so it's going to be a part, we're going to be having a bit of haggis. But anyway, we've got it. You have a look, fantastic houses, fantastic accommodation, all, all in all the court catering, everything's included. But anyway, if you join any of those or you book any of those, then you can join the academy whatever time. I don't restrict to that because obviously you're investing in training. So, um, that's all right, Kerry. Not a problem at all. So, yeah, get yourself on the mailing list uh, so you can see these things. Follow the page. And obviously, I'd love you to follow the Beyond the Lens Academy Facebook page, like and follow it. But as you know, and we, I was doing a whole masterclass last week with our pros about the Facebook algorithms and how we maximize Facebook. And we all know that if I put a post on there and uh, uh, 5,000 people follow it, it's not that many yet, but 
only probably a thousand unless I spend money on boost it will maybe see it maybe even less than that so even if you follow a page you don't always get to find out what's going on whereas if you're on the mailing list I can send stuff to you um and if you don't if you don't like what I'm sending you you can unsubscribe so anyway look um thanks for your time I really appreciate all your support and questions it's been quite an interesting evening so I really enjoyed it so I'm going to go and have, have myself a glass of wine um my phone is popped twice I've just seen the announcements there's another two members who've just joined in while I've been on here which is wonderful so I'm looking forward to meeting and greeting them um so um, hopefully see you in the academy if not um, see you on my webinars as we'll be doing more and more of those and thanks for your time have a great sunny evening have a good week next week and of course at the moment try and stay safe eh? thanks a lot bye